Uh, please turn your camera on if you can. If, if you can. Um, all guests will be muted uh, during the speaker's presentations, but we will unmute uh, those who want to ask questions during the Q&A part of the event. Uh, first, our speakers will give their presentations and then we'll move on to the questions and answers section of it. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat room. If you have technical difficulties, please message IWRP Central Asia, direct message in chat room by selecting his, the name to, in two section at the bottom of the chat room. Uh, if you wish to ask questions live, please use the raised hand function in the participants section. We will unmute you when it's your turn to ask a question. Um, and uh, with that, um, since we've, we've time is short uh, for what promises to be a fascinating discussion, I think um, I will just turn it over right now to Abahan Sultan Nazaro. He is the IWRP Central Asia Regional Director, and he will give us his opening remarks. So if you would, Abahan. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight at the IWPR Central Asia online discussion. Uh, today, we continue our work of uh, conducting a series of discussion about the challenges faced by Central Asia. Uh, we bring together, today we could bring together international experts and analysts uh, to hear their opinions uh, on the existing challenges, as well as hear possible solutions. And this allows for cross fertilizations mm -hmm. and generation of uh, unique new ideas. I would like to highlight that uh, we are able to implement uh, this kind of great activities thanks to generous support of our valid donors, uh, Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, who have been greatly supporting us for many years. Uh, today we'll talk about the most uh, acute problems in the post-Soviet space, growing social tension, resulting protest, political instability, in the, uh, as in the case of Kyrgyzstan. The arc of instability spans from the borderland in Eastern Europe and Caucasus, like protests in Belarus and Nagorno-Karabakh conflicts, to the steppes of Central Asia. So we see both similarities and striking differences in how the political trends develop. So they are defined by multiple socioeconomic factors. And these factors have to be evaluated in all their entire entirety. To navigate through the challenges, I would say between the devil of political instability and the deep blue sea of continuous corruption, we have to provide an analytical evaluation to the observed processes. So hence we are here today. I really hope today we, uh, our invited experts can guide us through these important topics and provide a detailed account of the drivers of protest movement in Central Asia. I look forward to a fruitful discussions and thank you very much for your attention. Bruce, over to you. Thank you very much, Abraham. Okay, we have some great speakers and some fascinating topics today. Uh, and, and I'm pleased that I can just sit in on this and listen. Um, so we'll just take them in the order that I have. And Colleen Wood, uh, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at Columbia University, uh, my old alma mater. Uh, and she's going to speak on the role of electoral institutions as a demand from citizens and a tool for consolidating power. So with that, Colleen, if you would please start us out. Great, thank you so much. Salam from New York, <laughs> where it's <laughs> six o'clock in the morning, but even though it's early, I'm super excited for this conversation. Um, yeah, as Bruce said, I'm going to talk about electoral institutions, which normally dry, boring, what the rules, who cares, but I think that these domestic institutions and the way that they're designed are really at the heart of the protracted political issues that Kyrgyzstan is having right now. Um, so Kyrgyzstan's constitution maintains a very careful balance of power between the president and parliament. Um, and the way that these institutions were designed um, have this goal in mind of how can we set up our rules about how we run elections, how people gain power in parliament, how the president should conduct his duties uh, or her duties in the case of Rosa Misakovma. Um, all of these are designed with this goal of maintaining a careful balance in mind. Um, so some of these examples of this include the fact that the president is limited to a single six year term, um, that there's a threshold that parties must cross in order to secure seats in parliament. 
Um, in 2010, after the revolution then, it was raised from 5% to 7% with a goal in mind of encouraging stronger political parties um, to participate in parliament as a better balance to the president um, after um, it was seen that Bakiyev had taken too much power for himself that we needed to create rules that incentivized stronger parties. Um, but unfortunately, these um, institutional design features that on the one hand ha had a noble goal in mind of limiting the power of the president um, ended up creating unintended consequences um, down the line. So that incredibly high threshold um, which was raised yeah, from 5% to 7% in 2010, was raised again from seven to 9% in 2017 after um, Jan Bekov became president, but then was lowered back down to seven. Um, this ended up making it incredibly different, difficult for opposition parties to gain seats in parliament. So when we have the, elect the elections on October 4th, even though there were 16 parties running, even though there were many popular um, and um, strong parties that were trying to run in the seven oblasts, um, only four of them ended up crossing that 7% threshold and able to gain seats. And this is frustration with this, the perception of business as usual, um, no real check on government authority or Jane Beckham's power was what drew people out to the streets in the first place on October 5th, the day after the elections. Um, and I think it was not, not expected that these protests would escalate to a point um, that would create a transition of power. Um, but um, I, it's been described as a, a, a rotten door revolution in which people show up to bang down the door and the, the system is so broken from the inside that the whole thing just collapses. And I think what we saw was a total abdication of responsibility and a realization that no one in charge actually wants to govern the country. And I think that that is why people were so quick to, to fold. Um, um, and so I think what was especially striking to me um, in watching the activists making demands during the first initial um, weeks of this political vacuum was uh, the unified call for a legal for operating within the legal framework. So we heard demands from former President Jane Bekov, from activists, from deputies of parliament that we need to work in the Pravovoya Polya, in the in the Kalk, the Muzam Talasa or Turajol. Um, the, everyone across the political spectrum was demanding we need to play by the rules we need to follow our our institutional rules um, and I, that was really striking to me that people uh across the political system had this demand and i anthropologist judith byer makes sense of this by she calls it constitutional hope that uh citizens hold the constitution very dearly that having gone through multiple revolutions, having survived and push, pushing through so much political uncertainty and uh, so many crises, the people do see the rules of the game as holding their leaders accountable. But I think this demand for operating within this legal framework has also then created some more um, interesting incentives for, for leadership. And I, I'm excited to talk about this more in the Q&A. But basically, Kyrgyzstan is at a crossroads right now in that the leadership is trying to change the rules of the game while still playing by the rules of the game. So right now we're at a crossroads. The, the, the country and the government is basically set itself up to choose between one of two paths. And what's been interesting is the as parliament has been meeting and having these extraordinary sessions, um, that they're passing um, passing laws and pass, setting themselves up for either of them. So on the one hand, in, in late October, there was a meeting in which at the exact same meeting, parliament voted to approve a reform, like tinkering with the electoral rules. So lowering the threshold from seven to 3% with the idea of that this will make it much easier for opposition parties to make it into parliament. We're going to lower the deposit that parties must pay to the electoral um, commission all of which should have made it easier for reform parties such as Reforma, but also the, the bigger and better known one, Atmikian, which was blocked from parliament with the high threshold. But in the same way that they're changing these rules to continue working with this presidential parliamentary balance system, Japadov, who's acting, uh, acting president and speaker of parliament, is pushing through reform of the whole system. 
in an interview with Al Jazeera, he says, you know what, we went too quickly to a, a parliamentary system. Our country is not ready for this. It's created these conflicts over and over. We, it's our third revolution in 15 years. Obviously something must be wrong with our electoral rules if this has been the outcome. Um, and so he is pushing for uh, a transition to a presidential system and uh, abandoning this parliamentary system entirely. Um, so I think what's interesting is that both of these reform processes, both of these attempts to change the rules of the game while still respecting the rules of the game are happening simultaneously. Um, and as we inch closer and closer to new presidential elections and maybe new parliamentary elections, um, depending on that battle, um, I think that the the contingent point is going to be which of these two paths wins out. Um, and I think that it'll be much clearer what um, what potentially could happen in Kyrgyzstan's um, political space, but then that also affects economic and social space as well. Um, once it's once one of those two paths are chosen, so at the moment it's impossible. I think to I don't know. There's no crystal ball that tells us which one of these two paths will be taken. But um, from an institutional design perspective, um, I think that activists, civil society members need to be really um, aware of the potential pitfalls of either of these institutional designs and craft their demands really carefully based on them. So I'll, I'll pass it over to the next speaker now and I'm really excited for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Appreciate that very much. Uh, and I was remiss in not mentioning that this event is co-sponsored by the Institute for War and Peace Reporting and the Central Asian Bureau of Analytical Research. Uh, and with that, let me move on to our next speaker, Fabio Indio. He is a PhD in geopolitics and a researcher for the Observatory for Central Asia and Caspian. So Fabio, if you could please give your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me. I'd like to thank you, the Institute for War and Peace Reporting to give me the opportunity to, to give my contribution to this uh, discussion. And uh, um, I prefer to focus uh, my and your attention to one of the aspects concerning political protest and demonstration in post-Soviet area, um, focusing my approach to the perception of the external actors which are involved in the region. Because as you know, um, Central Asia, um, manifest, uh, manifestation and uh, protest are not a common issue in uh, Central Asia and uh, against the government or, or against the power for several reasons, as you know, especially for the uh, more or less semi-authoritarian management of the power and for other issues. So Central Asia appear as a kind of island of stability and island of political continuity. Um, there were some um, political transition which uh, characterized some Central Asian countries, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan, but they were peaceful process. So there is a kind of political continuity which allowed this country to undertake their so-called multi-vector foreign policy, balancing the interest of the external actor. Kyrgyzstan represented an exception. In October 2020, Kyrgyzstan experienced their, um, its third uh, revolution, which on the one hand show how the civil society is strong in the country, how it is rooted a more or less um, uh, multipartitism system and uh, we, uh, which characterize a country as a more liberal compared to the other countries. However, Kyrgyzstan is affected by a, um, a condition of political instability, which affect the relation between these countries with uh, the external actor, mainly Russia and China. It is interesting that the main concerns of Russia and China focus on the so-called, geopolitically speaking, weak pounds in Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, because they don't have hydrocarbons, because they are economic weaker compared to Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, but they are also important because uh, they, these countries are highly involved in the multilateral initiatives and projects backed by Russia and China, and in the case of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, uh, in security terms, because they share a border with uh, China, so it's important. 
for China and Russia to preserve the status quo is a, one of the main uh, goal to achieve in order because a change in the political leadership could spread uncertainty and uh, um, so it could be that a new political leadership could be not aligned to the strategic interest of Russia and China. And before to speak about this new third intercoma revolution, it is interesting to observe that the Tulip Revolution in 2005 was perceived as a threat for China and Russia, because it, uh, this uh, tulip revolution was intended in, the, in line with the color revolution, which affected and uh, uh, reshaped the post-Soviet space, space and which, uh, uh, which was able to spread instability in a sensitive area, because Russia was linked, is linked to Kyrgyzstan in political terms and in security terms, because Kyrgyzstan is, as you know, member of the collective security treaty organization and also host the counter base and for um, the fact that Kyrgyzstan shared this sensitive border with China in uh, um, part of the Xinjiang region. At the same time, the scenario is profoundly changed compared to 10 or 15 uh, years ago, because Russia and China now have successfully implemented their multilateral initiative, the geoeconomic corridor based on interconnectivity the Belt and Road Initiative, which involved in a more or less rigid um, membership, Central Asian countries as, trans as transit region. So security are the main precondition in order to implement these multilateral initiatives. And it was, it was one, it will be one of the topic that I would like to discuss as a, uh, in the conclusion of my short um, presentation, the economic recession triggered and worsened by the global pandemic, which we will be able to sharpen political and social instability in Central Asian countries, but especially in the countries, geopolitically speaking, and also economically speaking, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. So, uh, increasing the concerns of Russia and China uh, to um, this potential source of instability in the region. Concerning the recent uh, uh, revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the political, uh, the, um, political vacuum, this disputed uh, political transition is a source of concern, especially because uh, Russia, and in the words of President Putin, disappointed and jam of resignation because uh, as you know putin defined this evolution as unfortunate because russia invested a lot of money in order to support and to increase kyrgyzstan um, stability and at the beginning of this kind of revolution um, russia and putin with a, a deputy chief of staff kozak uh, tried to play a role of mediation between Jembekov and the, um, the new president, the new acting president, uh, Japarov, but without success. And um, even if the new, uh, Kaz uh, the new Kyrgyz foreign uh, minister, Kaz uh, Kazakhbayev, reassured Russia concerning the fact that Russia will be the main partner, the main ally, Russia is disappointed because until the independence more or less all the Kyrgyz leaders were pro-Russian, Atambayev, Jambekov, and the others. So it is a very dangerous situation and sensitive situation for Russia for the lot of interest which Russia has in Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan is also one of the members of the Russian Economic Union, member of the CSTO, and is one of the main trade partners of Kyrgyzstan. So, as I mentioned before, security and stability and their reliable political leadership is necessary in order to implement this project. Concerning China, also for China, the instability in Kyrgyzstan is a threat. And after um, the uprising in Bishkek and in other cities of Kyrgyzstan, uh, Chinese authorities uh, asked to the new Kyrgyz authorities to protect and uh, to ensure the safety of legitimate rights and interests of Chinese um, citizens, enterprises, and, uh, uh, and investors in the country. Because uh, 
um, chi also China has a significant role in Kyrgyzstan. China uh, control more or less 40% of Kyrgyzstan debt, which is $1.8 billion. And uh, um, is the one of them is the main trade partner in China invested a lot of money not only in the energy sector, for instance, in the Kara um, Balta oil refinery, but also to uh, finance infrastructural projects which are under the banner of the Belt and Road Initiative, highways and the, the uh, railway corridor uh, from China crossing Kyrgyzstan to Uzbekistan, and also the line D of the China Central Asian gas uh, uh, pipeline. So. The problem is now if this condition of instability uh, will be a long-term factor which affect Kyrgyzstan, which in this case will affect China and uh, Russia interest in the region. So pushing them to a, to a um, kind of uh, um, leverage order to influence the events according to their strategic interest, I think in diplomatic and uh, political leverage. But, and uh, this is my conclusion, the problem will be in the coming month, in the coming month, because if there is a condition, a wide, widespread condition of political and social instability, which affects Central Asia, all the interest, the strategic energy and political and security interest uh, of China Russia will be affected, especially the regional uh, security architecture, which is based on Russia as a security provider, but also China is trying to um, increase its role in order to enhance the security in the region to protect the Belt and Road uh, corridor. So a very, very sensitive situation will, um, uh, will characterize Central Asia. And I think, unfortunately, that Kyrgyzstan could be only one or the step in order to um, uh, to describe a very um, very delicate, very sensitive situation, and hoping that uh, the new political leadership in Kyrgyzstan will be able to ensure um, to re to um, to restore the normal political life uh, in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, certainly are a lot of questions about Kyrgyzstan's new leadership. Um, okay, and our next speaker, move on, uh, Jennifer Murtazashvili, an uh, old friend of mine, uh, and an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh, Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, and her topic is going to be the crisis of governance in Central Asia. Jennifer, please. Unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. Sorry, I, I couldn't be unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for unmuting me. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, and thanks to the Central Asia Bureau for Analytical Reporting and the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. Um, what an enormous pleasure to be with such distinguished guests as well. Um, so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the crisis of governance. Uh, we see this, there's crisis of governance everywhere around the world right now. And I'm sitting to you, I'm, I'm sitting in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're in the midst of presidential elections here. And I think my county, my city will be at the epicenter of all of this. So if you're watching around the world and you see uh, the votes coming in from uh, Pennsylvania, we're sitting in the middle of it right here and it's quiet. We haven't seen any protests. Um, I think there's a lot of noise about this. I think we'll get through this. But we've seen a lot of crises of governance. In the United States, uh, COVID has really laid bare the ability of governments to respond. What is strong governments? What are weak governments? I think we've also understood that uh, democracy may not be the most pivotal ex explanation to understanding what achieves success, but I want to draw your attention to legitimacy. And legitimacy and democracy are closely intertwined. They're not necessary and sufficient conditions to produce one another. They are closely related, but they all are based on trust. And the trust that governments have from citizens 
is really going to determine, I think, the course of the trajectory that we see in Kyrgyzstan, in Central Eurasia, and many other countries. So we were asked to speak comparatively, you know, to put what's happening in Kyrgyzstan in comparative perspective. So I want to do that um, today. And, and I think it's also no small coincidence that we saw protests erupt in Belarus. Why? I mean, it, it, it doesn't escape us that Belarus really denied the existence of COVID for a very long time. And we can't help but think that this was a very deep pain for many citizens, especially sitting in Europe who are looking around, looking at how other governments respond. Of course, the issues in Belarus are far deeper than just that, but they often, these events can often seem as a trigger. So let's talk about Kyrgyzstan very briefly. Um, I think Colleen provided a fantastic introduction of, of many of the challenges that the countries faced. And I, I really like the way she put it. Uh, this rotten door revolution that no one in charge actually wants to govern the country. And to me, that really is the heart of the crisis that you're seeing. So in Kyrgyzstan, it seems that for many, many years, the government's ability to provide public services really collapsed. And I, you know, I, I always cite back to the 2009-2010 PISA survey that put educational levels in Kyrgyzstan as the lowest in the world. The, not just in the former Soviet Union, in the world, that educational achievements at the elementary level were devastatingly low. And that's a huge fall from grace from a country that was in the former Soviet Union, that was a Soviet Republic, that really prided itself on the provision of public goods. So what you saw in Kyrgyzstan is this amazing ability on the one hand, great risks, the government just sort of turned away for the institutional reasons that Colleen outlined, people in, in positions of power had very short time horizons. So what does that mean? It means that the government became sort of a piggy bank. It became a, a repository of money. And you know that you're not going to be in power for very long. So you take. And you know that if there's 10 prime ministers in 10 years, a prime minister is not going to be in power. What incentives do people have? If presidents know that they're going to be out the door in six years, what incentives do they have? So these institutional structures really undermine governance. So it, in, what you saw in the country is this ability of people just to turn away. They turned away from the state. That's an enormous risk. But on the other hand, there are huge sources of resilience in Kyrgyzstan. As we've seen, especially over the past six months, people understood that they couldn't rely on the state to provide public goods and services. So they were going to turn to their, to their own communities. They're going to look inwards. They're going to provide um, they're going to create new organizations and respond to this. And we've seen this over and over again. And in fact, Kyrgyzstan, I think, became a model for many other countries in Central Asia. You know, talking to, to colleagues in other countries, they're looking to what's happening in Kyrgyzstan among the youth, among um, social organizations to see how are they responding to this because of the country's really vibrant um, civil society. But what drove this real state weakness to civil unrest. And I think that's the key. Many countries in the world have governments that don't perform, but very few actually have the kind of unrest that we've seen in Kyrgyzstan. And the immediate trigger of this were corrupt elections. Corruption. Corruption is a huge driver. We all see corruption as you know, what public servants do or what they don't do, paying a bribe here, paying a bribe there. But the situation of COVID really makes this, this um, problem much more acute for reasons I'll talk to you in a second. I want to uh, you know, take our lenses out just a little bit as we think about Kyrgyzstan. Um, you know, as someone who works on governance in the region, legitimacy is really key to maintaining stability and security and responding to citizens' needs. We know that trust is really important to building this legitimacy, but we know that countries don't have to be democratic to be legitimate nor do they have to be democratic to gain trust. So I don't want to confuse this as a talk about democracy. It's a talk about legitimacy. So I've worked for many, many years on Afghanistan. And what do we know about the conflict in Afghanistan? We have many disagreements about what can be done about that conflict. We have many disagreements about a peace agreement, many disagreements about ways forward, but almost every single analyst who works on that country agrees that the driver, the main driver of that conflict is not ethnicity, is not religion, it's governance. It's not the fact that the government just doesn't perform, it's that the government became predatory. 
over the past 20 years. The government was taking from people, and this drives a very, very deep kind of alienation, right? So if we're looking at different countries around the world, when does a country go from being corrupt, lazy, broken door, not wanting to govern, to actually being predatory? This is an enormous risk. And so I think that's one of the risks that we saw in Kyrgyzstan. It was this predation that people experienced around the time of the election that really was a tipping point. Um, you know, in terms of other countries in the region, uh, are there risks for instability? You know, we've seen um, really amazing protests happening, you know, quietly in Kazakhstan and to some extent in Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan, we've seen protests in recent years over things like land demolition. And this becomes a really deep source of alienation for citizens because they've been promised that things will change, things will be different. But when people perceive that the government's behaving in a predatory manner, when they're taking their property without compensation, this becomes a source of enormous alienation. And that is when you go from just corruption to alienation, there's enormous risks for governments when these kinds of things occur. And understanding that where those thresholds are is very, very difficult. So uh, I'll just talk to you a little bit about a paper that I just wrote on China which is also in the region, it's a Kyrgyzstan's neighbor. And we are trying to understand this issue of land demolitions in China, which is also a huge issue that's driven protest. It's a very similar to actually what's happened in Uzbekistan. Um, and so we wanted to understand, you know, to what extent do people perceive these demolitions to be legitimate and how do they feel about government compensation? So you would think that, you know, conventional wisdom is you just give people money you satisfy them and they'll go away, right? You give them a new apartment, you give them some resources and you can solve the problem. What we found in China is the problem is much more complicated actually. So the market value of their home matters, but what actually matters most is procedural legitimacy, is to, for people to feel like they were treated fairly. So their willingness to accept a land demolition isn't just contingent on financial remuneration, it's contingent on how they feel. Was the process transparent, right? Were people taking things from me? <clears throat> this is something, it's not about democracy. It's about finding ways to be more transparent, to, be, to allow people to participate in processes, but also gaining legitimacy and trust through processes that may not be democratic at all. So this is a real crisis. And I think I just want to end very briefly with thinking about, you know, the, I'm going through these examples from the region to think about how crises emerge, where we see alienation emerge, where we go from, you know, petty corruption, things that people are being used to every single day to this kind of uh, something that triggers mass upheaval. What we're witnessing now, I think is very, very worrisome because countries around the world are facing a very deep fiscal crisis. And this is not particular to Central Asia, Central Eurasia. This is a, a, something that we're gonna have to watch out all over the world. Fiscal crises drive instability, but especially in countries that do not have legitimate governments that are trusted by citizens. Why? Because imagine you, you have a country and you have corruption and people are used to corruption and it happens for a long time and people just sort of ignore it, okay? Then they'll say it's part of our, our culture. I don't believe that at all, right? These are, these are institutional manifestations. But when you have these deep revenue collapses, this really increases the incentives of politicians to behave very badly because they're used to feeding their own networks. They're used to feeding their friends, their families, and all of a sudden those resources are no longer available. So this deep fiscal collapse, I'm very worried that it's gonna over the long term, and especially as we go into the winter months, turn into something much more predatory. And as you go into predation, that really risks, um, you know, increases risks for civil conflict. Um, so I, I, let's think about how these events are playing out. What is, so this takes us also back to revenue, which is the heart of governance and governments can't collect revenue unless they have trust. We know, we know this. So trust really is at the heart of the governance crisis. 
This is not necessarily about democracy. Democracies do produce much more trust in the long term than in the short term. But there are ways that governments can get the trust of their citizens without promising transitions to democracy. So this is something I think we should all keep an eye out for in the months and weeks to come. Thank you. And thanks for such a you know, wonderful invitation. And I'm really excited to hear from you in the Q&A. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Uh, and a reminder too, that if you wanna ask questions, uh, please put them in the chat room because we're down to our last two speakers. Um, and on that note, our next speaker is Akram Umarov. Uh, he's the project coordinator for a development strategy center. And he's going to speak about South Caucasus conflict lessons for Central Asia. So please Akram. You need, uh, yeah, thank you. Ah. Yeah, thank you very much for this excellent opportunity and for uh, being with such excellent panelists. And I would like to take slightly broader picture of Central Asia and uh, to talk, as you mentioned, mostly about this lessons from the South Caucasus for the on, from the ongoing conflict around the Nagorno-Karabakh. So. Uh, this conflict uh, entered a new phase of, of escalation on September 27th, when the troops of uh, this unrecognized uh, Nagorno-Karabakh army, supported by Armenia and Azerbaijan, entered into these battles. And despite this, the international community is making extremely cautious and uncertain attempts to achieve a ceasefire in the conflict zone and start a negotiation process. process. And this escalation of tensions in the South Caucasus, the current development of the conflict and its potential outcome should be, in my view, carefully studied by all Central Asian countries. Given this close uh, political, economic, cultural, and humanitarian ties, as well as the recent common historical past, regions of South Caucasus and Central Asia have many similar achievements. Unfortunately, uh, achievements, problems, and uh, the specifics of their independent development. Unfortunately, after this independence period, our connections uh, slightly decreased uh, due to some ob uh, obvious reasons. And now the level of political and economic cooperation between these regions are not very high, but still the processes are, very, are quite similar and we can learn a lot from each other. So I would like to, to pay your attention on the three major uh, lessons for the region. First of all, the role of external powers in the settlement of regional issues. At the current development of the situation in South Caucasus demonstrates the main external forces which are capable to influence the conflict are mainly Russia and Turkey. Of course, we can see the presence of the United States, France, but due to different reasons than mostly on the sidelines of this conflict right now. And the major players are Russia and Turkey. And both of these countries have historical strategic interests in this region and clearly ex intend to expand their presence in this area. Unfortunately, these countries have made their own contribution uh, to the uh, current escalation of the conflict by almost synchronous conduct of large scale military exercises, by the long term uh, a supply of uh, weapons to both sides of the conflict. So they're also somehow involved in this escalation and in the current uh, conflict in this region. Central, Central Asia is also facing the growing presence of uh, China, Russia, Turkey, the United States, the European countries like Germany and France and other powers in the region. But however, the experience of the so South Caucasus and other regions demonstrates we need to avoid turning the region into the arena of competition and confrontation between the leading world powers. And the practice of neighboring regions clearly shows that the absence of truly intra-regional cooperation, the transfer of the role of arbiter to the leading powers uh, can increase instability and exacerbate existing regional problems. So uh, these extra regional actors can be interested in the long-term preservation of this status quo situation and turbulence in the region, which increases their importance and their influence and creates conditions for the 
conflicting parties to turn to them for various support or intermediary services. So we can observe this right now. You can see that almost each, every day, the Armenian prime minister appeals to the Russian side, asking for support, asking for political, military support. Also, we can see the same, um, uh, absolutely the same situation with Azerbaijan, appealing to the support of Russia, to Turkey, in this conflict. In these conditions, it's important for the Central Asian states to adhere to multi-vector foreign policy and to avoid over-reliance on some external forces. And what is more important, to create truly regional mechanisms of interaction. They will contribute not only to building a political, social, economic, cultural, and other types of cooperation, but also to a planned and comprehensive discussion of consolidated regional position on the most important issues and for, for promoted initiatives of extra regional actors. So we are, we are observing the, 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 uh, the role of China and its uh, uh, promotion of Belt and Road Initiative, but uh, could we really see the regional reaction to this? We can mostly observe bilateral discussions and negotiations between Kazakhstan and China, Uzbekistan and China, Kyrgyzstan and China on how to implement this project in the region. But uh, the, the, the idea of initiative says that it, it, uh, it needs to connect the region. It, it's, it aims to increase connectivity and this connectivity cannot be reached without truly regional approach, not the mostly bilateral approach. It's encouraging that starting from 2018, the countries of Central Asia have began annual consultative regional meetings on the level of uh, the leaders of these countries. The, such format it's, uh, it's makes it possible to, to discuss the urgent problems of the region in a regional atmosphere and think over ways to resolve them. Unfortunately, uh, this, this year, the, the regional countries decided to postpone this meeting. Um, I think uh, we, sh we still should make at least some online meeting. Uh, it was, uh, it was to, due to some objective reasons of this current instability in Kyrgyzstan, because Kyrgyzstan should host this event, but due to the ongoing situation, it's not possible. So the countries decided to postpone it. But I think it's still very important to conduct such meetings, at least online, to discuss the regional issues, especially the coordination of efforts, for example, on tackling the pandemic. We could see that regional countries somehow uh, very positively cooperated in this period of pandemic, but most of this cooperation was limited on, on bilateral level. But I think it's in, truly important to have regional coordination and cooperation. There was some discussions of coordination of efforts on, on uh, fighting a pandemic, but they were mostly limited again with the role of external uh, powers. So such meetings uh, appeared within Turkey Council, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but unfortunately not within truly Central Asian format. So uh, the second uh, lesson, which I would like to, uh, to underline the creation of the image of external enemies out of uh, neighboring countries. So the, the emergence of, since the emergence of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in the late 1980s, both Armenia and Azerbaijan have been actively working to promote the discourse about the presence of external enemy in the face of, uh, uh, from the neighboring state, which is extremely belligerent and not ready to make rational compromises and therefore unable to negotiate on peaceful settlement. And this approach contributed to the high ideologization of the foreign policies of Armenia and Azerbaijan and limited the, the, uh, even the small interactions which could be possible between the sides. And now uh, it's even more difficult for the leadership of two countries to make some uh, concessions because the, this ideology of enemy makes it, their options very limited. In, in the history of Central Asia, we also face some such situations, not so on, on such advanced level, like in, in, in the South Caucasus, but still we had some similar 
situations. So the serious difficulties arose in relation between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, especially the issue of construction of hydroelectric power plants on the uh, Tajik territory has made a negative contribution to this bilateral cooperation. Uzbekistan perceived this as a threat to its national security. And at the same time, Dushanbe tried to continue the implementation of this initiative and raise this uh, initiative to the level of national ideology. And they, they, and they praised that this uh, project will contribute to the uh, revival of the country and the solution of the most pressing economic problems of the country. And in this context, Tajikistan blamed the slow progress of the construction of the, this power, uh, electric power station on the, on the very negative position of its hostile neighbor in the face of Uzbekistan. Despite, and it's very uh, good uh, sign that during the recent years, we, we could radically change this uh, hostile atmosphere in the region in, in more positive direction. And the new regional policy of Uzbekistan is trying to create an atmosphere of trust and uh, mutually beneficial cooperation and solve the long-standing interstate problems. But however, despite this positive dynamics of the regional interaction, it's important to remember the lessons from our own past and also the experience of source Caucasus and avoid the promotion of the discourse of external enemy were from our uh, immediate neighbors. And this could help to deepen our synergy uh, in the region. Finally, the third uh, lesson uh, is that we need to timely settle the all pressing issues uh, of this regional cooperation. The experience of source Caucasus clearly showed that all attempts to freeze the settlement of complex regional issues and stand on the status quo position is not very um, efficient. The, this, the parties haven't been able to normalize this conflict and find some solution all for, over the, for over 30 years, despite this international mediation efforts and uh, adoption of several Security Council resolutions. And as a result of this lack of progress in the peace negotiations, the parties, both Armenia and Azerbaijan at times make attempts by military means, means to reverse the status quo and uh, the advance the settlement of the conflict in their own, in their own favor. The, the, our region also faced a number, also facing a number of uh, important problems such as incomplete settlement of state borders, the rational water usage of water, so in the presence of interethnic tensions in certain parts of the region and, and also a deterioration of the ecological situation. And for example, still we haven't uh, settled the state border, uh, about 10% of state border between Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. And what is a more vulnerable 40% of border between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. So these borders are, these parts of the borders are still not delimited. And on these unsettled parts of the border and enclave territories, uh, sometimes occur clashes between local residents and border service, border services of these countries, which can even lead to uh, casualties and injuries from both sides. And uh, the regional countries, of course, aware of these problems, and uh, they they are trying to respond to these pressing issues. And we we could see already some positive signs on this direction. So during the recent years, Kazakhstan could finish uh, the delimitation and even mostly demarcation with Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan uh, finished this process with its neighbors, uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, but still. The border between Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan needs more attention. The issue of water resources also needs uh, the attention of the parties. Of course, we, we are now uh, leaving the excessive securitization of this problem and politicization of this problem. And we are trying to concentrate more on the positive agenda 
between the in the uh, relationship which, uh, between the regional countries, but still this problem has not disappeared. It's still on the agenda. It's not the priority one, but still on the agenda. So we shouldn't leave it for a long term on the sidelines of our agenda. We should still pay a lot of attention and we should try to solve this issue uh, using this positive atmosphere, which is now uh, dominant in our region. So what is important in this term, the formation of this intra-regional formats for constant discussion of topical problems. And again, it's, uh, we need to continue this uh, regional consultative meetings. And of course, uh, we should also uh, pay attention that other countries are also trying to use this regional mechanism. We could see that uh, first time in the history of uh, Russian Central Asian cooperation, the Russian side initiated this uh, multilateral format, Russia Central Asia, first time in the history. China initiated China Central Asia format. So before we usually had such formats like with European Union, with United States, with Japan and South Korea, but now this, uh, the regional actors, uh, Russia and China also trying to use this mechanism and uh, to increase their uh, presence. Of course, these mechanisms are also very important. We can discuss many important significant issues and find solutions and advance our cooperation, but still we need more truly regional cooperation and intra-regional formats. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm open for any uh, questions and comments. Great, thank you, Akram, appreciate that one. Okay, we have one more speaker and thanks. I see we're getting a lot of questions already. Um, so our, our last speaker, uh, best save the best for last, I think, uh, Fleming uh, Spiltzbull, I hope, uh, ha Hansen, is that right? That's fine. Spites? Spitesbull? Spitesbull. Spitesbull, okay, thank you, thank you, apologies. No, no uh, senior researcher from the Danish Institute for International Studies, uh, and he's going to, his specialty is domestic developments, foreign policy, and the use of military cap uh, capacities. Um, so, Fleming, could you please go ahead and start? Sure, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me, of course, to, to be here. And it's really nice to see colleagues again. Most of us uh, don't really have daily interaction with colleagues, so it's, it's nice to, to feel this stimulation. Um, I'm speaking to you from, from Denmark, uh, and right now, of course, there's great focus in Denmark on the development in Belarus. And I gave a talk just recently on Belarus and developments following the uh, election on 9th of August. And for some reason, it was spontaneous, I drew in the example of Kyrgyzstan. And I said to the audience, look, you don't need a zillion people, you need a few thousand really uh, devoted Kyrgyz people and, and, and they will set something on fire. And of course, I didn't mean to endorse uh, any kind of violence and, and to suggest that people should set anything on fire. And, and this is also what I want to emphasize today. But it is interesting, of course, to compare some of these different states because they come from similar backgrounds. So the Soviet past, the, the totalitarian past, is shared by some of these states. Now we have interesting developments. We have Belarus now on the one side, we have Kyrgyzstan on the other side, and then perhaps somewhere in between, we have presidential election in Moldova also. And Moldova, of course, have also previously experienced uh, quite dramatic uh, political changes. So. With that in mind, how do we account for this and, and how may we explain some of these differences? Now, what we just learned from some of the speakers is that there is a, a lack of, of interest in, in holding on to power in Kyrgyzstan to take power, assume power. And I definitely agree with that. I see that also as a problem, but we need to keep in mind that at the other end of the spectrum, as we witness now in Belarus, we have very different problems. Uh, we have a president who refuses to surrender power. And so the, the let's say, the lack of, of interest in a way, the, uh, the lack of interest in assuming power because it is so difficult, clearly is not a, is not a solution. Um, but then at the same time, of course, we shouldn't just applaud anyone who, who wants to, to keep power for the sake of power. But Kyrgyzstan, now that I'm invited to speak, I would like to take a, a more positive spin on developments in Kyrgyzstan. So when I compare, for instance, the post-election uh, 
demonstrations and, and, and protests that we have seen in Belarus, of course, are of a very, very different nature. This is a, a society that has been well suppressed for a very long time. It's extremely difficult for them to organize. It's very difficult for them to find the political energy and the dynamics that will take them into the street. Um, part of the sort of the, uh, the rationale of a, of a modern authoritarian government is of course to atomize society, to make sure that people cannot communicate. And what we see in Kyrgyzstan instead and have witnessed, despite what was also said, the three revolutions, which of course is not positive. This is not what you want. But if we take a positive, put a positive spin on this, what you want, of course, is political energy. You want political dynamics and you want someone to go into the street when they find that something is wrong. And this may be because of fiscal issues, as was suggested, lack of governance, as was suggested, all kinds of issues. But what we do see is that people go into the street and they find the energy and they mobilize and they manage also in some ways to uh, uh, to organize and, and to and to go together. Um, I see also the questions coming in and, and we need, of course, to have uh, time to, to address the different questions. But I see questions already coming in concerning the constitutional setup that we also heard about earlier, the move from a parliamentary to the semi-presidential, even someone asked, Timo asked here about super-presidential system. And Kyrgyzstan, I think, is at a very interesting point right now. Studies show that the average lifespan of a dictatorship has increased dramatically in the past 25 years. So until about the year 2000, it was about 10 years was the average life expectancy for a dictatorship. Now, since the year 2000, it increased to about 25 years. And what we see is that they use uh, modern information and communications technologies very well. They use them in a cynical way, they use them in expert way to monopolize the information space. And with that, I want to suggest that there is a risk. I'm not indicating that Kyrgyzstan, of course, is moving in this direction, but it seems that with the advance of new information communication technology, there is an increased risk of dictatorship uh, holding on to power simply by the use of that. So once put in place, if once allowed, it may be more difficult to get rid of. So they have sharpened their tools. And this is why we see also uh, that they survive longer. This may be especially true for, for a country like Kyrgyzstan. Now, when I spoke at this earlier session about Belarus and Kyrgyzstan, it struck me, of course, also that they're both anomalies. As you all know, we used to refer to Kyrgyzstan as the Switzerland of, uh, of Central Asia. Using the same analogy, we may speak about Belarus as the North Korea of Europe. And we know, of course, from the literature that neighborhoods matter. It's very important to look at neighborhoods. It's very difficult to be a democratic or semi-democratic state in an area surrounded by authoritarian governments. It's also very difficult, as Belarus has somewhat managed, to stay authoritarian, to remain a dictatorship, even when almost surrounded by EU member states, at least uh, cited uh, as on on, on, to the north and west, Lithuania and Poland. So neighborhoods matter, and that may prove more difficult for Kyrgyzstan perhaps in the future, at least if it goes, especially perhaps if it goes in sort of the wrong direction. So with that, uh, I think this is a critical point. I would like, as I said, to put a positive spin on this to see the political activities that we have witnessed in Kyrgyzstan as a sign of a, of a relatively mature political community and, and groups of citizens who have the ability and the, the energy and the strength to go out. Um, where that comes from, I would leave to political anthropologists to sort out. Part of it could, could simply be the reason that there is part of a, a sort of a degree of disunity within the state, that there is a, a distrust within the state across different regions and so on. But other members of the panel or uh, people attending uh, will know much, much more about this than I do. Let me just wrap up with a few comments on some of the issues that were brought up. The regional aspect, I agree. The regional aspect, as I said also now, neighborhoods do matter. The regional aspect is really important. What I think that we can witness now when we look at 
Belarus will look at the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh that Akram put out so, so well for us, but also in Kyrgyzstan, is that Russia is losing influence in the post-Soviet space. And I think that's super interesting. It may also have long-term consequences. And China, to some extent, as we all know, is ready to move in. I also see in the Russian literature increasing criticism of Chinese influence in Central Asia, plus elsewhere, including in the Arctic, for instance, which I follow. Uh, but I see this also in Central Asia. And where that leaves the countries, I think, is a bit uncertain. In the best of worlds, it would give Kyrgyzstan and the other countries in Central Asia some room for maneuver. It would give them an ability to, to play uh, different actors uh, out against each other and perhaps benefit from this. But definitely, I, I see long-term changes that may be uh, very important. And then, of course, on, on uh, the corona pandemic, this, I believe, could have, it doesn't necessarily have to have, but it could have system upsetting uh, qualities. Um, we're seeing states, even here in Europe, uh, struggling from this. We're seeing political protests to an extent that we haven't seen before. Uh, we see this now in Italy, for instance, where people are in the streets. We see it in the UK. Uh, we even had a demonstration in the center of Copenhagen yesterday, people protesting against uh, COVID restrictions. And this may be a defining moment uh, we heard about. It's not so much perhaps about democracy and lack of democracy. It's more about the extent to which this, the, the government is able to deliver. And this is also a crucial moment for many regimes. Can they deliver during a time of crisis as we see it now? And that may prove give them some kind of legitimacy, it may also rob them of whatever legitimacy they may have had. So this could, doesn't have to be, but this could in many ways be a defining moment, including for Kyrgyzstan and some of the other states, including also for a state uh, such as Russia even. So with that, I, I suggest to end because I see we have super interesting questions and we need to go over some of these, but thank you for now. Fleming, thank you very much. Uh, and you're right, we do have a lot of questions. I'm gonna try, hopefully I can try to boil some of these down so we can get to as many as possible. Um, the role of civil society, uh, these are specific to Kyrgyzstan, the questions here. Um, but, but even in Kazakhstan, for instance, we see something of civil society emerging now post Nazarbayev. More people are willing to go out and protest and make demands of the government. Um, now, to what, to what extent do these civil society groups actually reflect the will of the people? And, and then to what extent are these civil society groups able to, to counter the authorities as we've just seen in, in the, for example, in Kyrgyzstan where they were unable to prevent uh, the emergence and rise of Japarov and his crew, uh, even though they were sub, to some extent uh, you know, present and responsible for uh, the events that, that led to the downfall of Jay and Becca's government. What is the role of civil society now? And, and like I said, how is it, is it a grassroots movement? Has it emerged, it developed into something else? Uh, you know, and, and what kind of power does it have? Anybody? Jen? I have to un unmute Jennifer, please. No? There we okay. go. Thank you. So I, I think, <clears throat> you know, the questions on civil society are really interesting. And I'm sure Colleen also has insights on this. Um, but I think we have to distinguish between, um, and I think there's a question about the business associations and like civil society failed. Let's be like very clear. I think um, Fleming spoke also about the sort of this digital age that we're in and, and how protests are emerging. Um, there is an old civil society in Kyrgyzstan, right? Like that's been around for a very long time. And I'm not convinced that this old civil society of you know, formal NGOs that have been registered and that have gone through these processes are really the future. Um, I think there are things that like donors can support and they've been sort of good allies of you know, folks like USAID for, for a very long time. But you know, what I've noticed over the past 10 years, really throughout the region, is that these civil society organizations don't have the kind of legitimacy that newer forms of organizations have. And so we've entered this digital revolution, right? And so the digital revolution on the one hand, I mean, I think it's also creating sort of a bifurcation. So, um, so I, I think that question really pointed out like the business associations like stood by, 
<clears throat> you know, how can they be relied on? But on the other hand, you're seeing a lot of mobilization in really spontaneous ways that are happening in amongst urban, you know, the urban educated elites in the cities, um, the educated, you know, people who go to these kinds of seminars, right? Who are really mobilized, who are tuned in, who are playing, you know, really interested in politics. But on the other hand, I think you're also seeing another kind of civil society and that, um, that is even being strengthened during this period. And that's sort of the more traditional customary forms, things that are based in communities, jamats, you know, lots of discussion with this in Kyrgyzstan, Mahalas and Uzbekistan and in, in Tajikistan. Um, in, in Afghanistan, we've really seen like, it's, I mean, it's amazing during the height of the state building project where you expected to see the state, you saw a complete resurgence of traditional society. Why? Because these are things that people can depend on. So people are searching for organizational forms that they think will help them respond to crises. We tend to see civil societies, you know, advocacy organizations that are registered and formal with flip charts and all that great stuff. I think we really need to rethink that. We're, we're in the begin, beginning of a huge revolution in terms of organization um, that's going to take us from old forms, but also help reinvent new forms as well. Pauline, you want to add something? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, and I think um, Jennifer's comment on needing to rethink who counts as civil society is both from the perspective of experts, and I think that a lot of the academic definitions of what counts as civil society, what does it mean to have a strong or a weak civil society need to be rethunk. And I think that the way to do that is to listen to groups on the ground and the way that these groups define themselves. So one thing that I've found super interesting in watching Kyrgyzstan closely is the total hesitance of youth activists to call themselves political actors or to call themselves civil society. You see in their Instagram accounts, on their Facebook posts, that they're really careful about calling themselves civic movements, social movements, not political actors. They are very, very clear about calling themselves apolitical. And I think this is important to pay attention to, that they see politics, high politics, as dirty, as a space that has been tainted by corruption. And that reticence to be involved and to be political actors is really important to watch. But um, I'd wanted, yeah, so then when we say like, okay, um, I think it was Jeff Bell had some questions about, you know, really like how, how big of a deal is the civil society? And I think that when you take the definition, um, this more traditional definition that Jennifer laid out of uh, like these formally registered groups that um, receive funding from international actors, that yes, we saw basically um, an abdication of getting involved during the early days of the political crisis from these groups, but definitely not from this spontaneous mobilization of citizens. Um, so I think the fact that we saw these massive drujini, the, the civic guards um, that showed up to literally link arms and stand around buildings and businesses to protect people from looting shows that there is a really, um, I think, deep investment and determination to protect society from politics and from political actors. Um, and so I think that we need to rethink what we mean by strong civil society, that if it's a pure numbers game or a pure Bishkek versus the regions game, it does give the perception that it's pretty weak. But I think to another potential definition that we could take for strong civil society is the way that these groups articulate demands. So even in the last year, um, the way that groups have been, um, these civic movement groups, so we have Bashtan Bashta, um, Tajadam, El Dinunu in, in Kyrgyzstan, the way that these groups are articulating demands on the government has grown to be a lot more sophisticated in the last year. So it started with the Reaxia protests um, when the report about um, the corruption scandal with, involving the Matrayima family came out. The initial reaction from civil society, from, from social movements was um, corruption bad, basically like really just like grammarless, really no structure to their demands. But in as the political crisis following the elections played out, we have Bashtan Bashta is releasing every single day, really sophisticated Instagram posts using stories, using TikTok. Um, in both Russian and in Kyrgyz, importantly, in which they're laying out really specific demands about how the electoral institutions should be redesigned. They made a demand that whoever would be elected speaker of parliament should be someone who's not trying to run for president, should be someone who's just there to carry over the sixth parliament to the seventh. I think that this articulation and understanding of the rule of law beyond just like, this is our constitution, 
um, we want rule of law, but an understanding of the specific institutional design elements shows strength in sophistication rather than strength in numbers. And I think the fact that they're communicating this both in Russian and in Kyrgyz speaks to the fact that this is not just a Bishkek, not just an urban educated movement, that these young people are really conscious of bringing in the wider regions into this conversation and like doing grassroots political education for people who might not have had access to that. So I think that the the hesitation to say, ah, civil society is the future is, is warranted. But um, I, I agree with Fleming that I think that there's a lot of room for optimism when, when we look at Kyrgyzstan right now. Okay. Thank you, Colleen. And thank you for bringing in the youth factor, since that was also part of one of the other questions too. Um, there's uh, some questions here about the use of information technologies, and, and I would expand that a little bit. You know, the social networks, hopefully we can bring uh, Fabio in, for instance, too, on some of this. But there was, uh, you know, information that, that the effective use of so social networks was what really propelled Jafar up to the, to the front. Uh, to the top there, and, and that it was done in Kyrgyz language as opposed to Russian language. So if, if um, we get some of the speakers not only to speak about the role of, of information technology and social networks, but also on, on means to counter this, because it struck me when Kyrgyzstan, when all this went on in Kyrgyzstan, that it probably would not have been possible in neighboring states where they have much more control and, and the ability to shut down the internet very quickly. Um, so if we could start out with, uh, you know, what, what is the role of information technology, what is the role of social networks, and then also move into what is the role in, in, that other countries play, China or Russia, in countering uh, these very things and making sure that the situation doesn't get out of control because of use of social networks. <clears throat> Fleming, you want to go first? Well, thank you. I would love to. Uh... It's 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 very interesting. It's very relevant, of course, and I see a comment also from uh, from Gulzat who says that this is really relevant for for the present discussion in, in Kyrgyzstan, including as 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 is mentioned here. She mentions uh, the fact that it may ground the claims of some of the populist uh, politicians. So, um, info, new information communication technologies, uh, of course, are central to political thinking. Uh, they are in democracies as, as, as well. And some of the states that we are dealing with in, let's say, within the, the CIS area, it's on the one hand, it's a, it's a tool for mobilization. Uh, now you mentioned some of the neighboring states. Uh, I used to live in, in Tajikistan and, and it's, it's more complex, of course, in, in Tajikistan. Suddenly things will be shut off. Uh, so it's, it's a tool, it's, a, it's quite a simple tool for mobilization. As we saw it also in, in Moldova, for instance, as we see it now in Belarus uh, with uh, Telegram. So, so it's, it's something that, that can be used and information can be shared and people can be mobilized. It's also, on the other hand, of course, a tool that the regime can use to, in a way, I mean, if it wants to, as we see in, in some of the more extreme cases, simply to monopolize uh, the information space. And it has done so before, of course. So the, the information space was monopolized in the Soviet Union, and it was done so quite well. This is different, however. It's, it's, it's a similar monopolization of the information space, but it's also the use of new technologies that are much more advanced, that can be designed in a way to influence voters in a different way. So it uses a multitude, of course, of, of, uh, of effects, in order to, to do so. I just finished the study. I'd be happy to share it if I can. It's on, uh, will be present in the uh, Journal of Slavic Military Studies on, on the Russian thinking about information operations to influence audiences, uh, both domestic and international audiences. And there is an enormous thinking about this and it's really interesting, but it's also really advanced and it sees that the, the modern information communication technologies are much different from what used to be and the way that the information space can be monopolized is also very different so in a way it's a race between those who want to use the new technologies for mobilization and the spread of information and for those who want to use new technologies to monopolize to monopolize uh, the space and to cement uh, their control of society and as i suggested earlier Studies have indicated that the average lifespan of a dictatorship has grown quite dramatically. And that indicates, of course, that dictatorship, taken as a whole, are winning this race. 
that they understand how to use this and they may use it effectively to uh, to push out alternative uh, types of information. And that's a very worrying uh, development, of course, and something that we need to keep in mind also when we look at, at Kyrgyzstan. Fabio? Okay, I try to give my contribution to this uh, interesting debate. Also highlighting one factor, I about uh, the position of uh, my previous colleague, but on the one hand, it's true that the new technologies can give a wider visibility to the protest, to the, um, the reasons of uh, manifestation and the reasons of the opposers to the government or to the political leadership. On the other hand, we don't forget that uh, most of the autocratic states, most of the political um, authorities has also the possibility to shut down the uh, new technologies. So it depends on the level. <laughs> it's it's wrong to to say that, but it's depend on the level of autocracy of a country because of through that it's uh, the situation of Kyrgyzstan cannot be compared to other countries in the region. Kyrgyzstan appear and is liberal compared to others. And there is the possibility to share views to, um, to discuss about some topics. And this possibility is not true or is not possible for other countries. On the other hand, is also true about the situation in Belarus. Belarus is uh, known as one of the main um, um, control countries in the world, but um, following the uprising, following the rest of the population, a lot of um, a lot of videos, a lot of social requests of um, Belarus um, movement and people reach Western countries, reach a wider uh, audience. So it could be a tool, but I don't want to emphasize this tool, especially because, as I mentioned, the authorities has the possibility to shoot down uh, moving uh, forward to a um, stronger autocratic um, management of the power. So it is possible to use, and uh, it is a wider and is a successful tool, but there are some limits that, uh, especially with countries which develop partners with high technologies and interested countries to control social media like China, but other countries could be a way to, um, to downplay the strategic importance of these uh, tools. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, and we have a question here about that mentions, you know, that this is uh, that three times now we've had problems in Kyrgyzstan, uh, protests have, over, have replaced the governments, so it could happen again for the fourth time. And the question that, that's here is what should be done by the government and international actors to prevent it. But I'd like to uh, play on something that Akram mentioned too. We see that that Kyrgyzstan's new foreign minister, Kazakhbayev, visited Kazakhstan and he's going to Uzbekistan. So I, I would also want to include in this question, what role can the regional, the, the regional players, and I mean Central Asian players, have uh, in helping preserve stability in Kyrgyzstan? And would it necessarily be a positive or would it be a negative role to keep the status quo, if some might consider that a negative role? Um, so what can, what can international actors do to prevent uh, a fourth revolution in Kyrgyzstan? Thank you very much. I think, Bruce, you, you, have, you have very excellent point. We are talking a lot about the role of the distant powers of the United States, Russia, European countries, and in, in, in Kyrgyz uh, instability and how they can uh, respond to this. But we are mostly missing how the Central Asian countries should respond to this. Uh, in my, my perception that this crisis was absolutely unexpected for the regional countries. Uh, I, I assume that this mostly happened due to this last year uh, small instability around Mr. Atambaev and the J.M. Bekov could finally put him in the jail and th this was sign of this power of J.M. Bekov. And I think that it was therefore they, they hadn't any uh, prediction that these parliamentary elections could end with such result and that J.M. Becker will resign so, so, such, uh, so quickly. So therefore the situation was very unexpected, but uh, regional countries that tried somehow to coordinate the efforts and it's very good, again, it's very good for my point that they at least they made some 
common statement that they would like to to see the situation in this country in the legal uh, area that everything should be according to this uh, constitution of the Kyrgyzstan according to the legislation of this country and it was I think a very uh, important um, uh, sign for the Kyrgyz side that uh, that it shouldn't be very uh, some the uh, street level protests and everything decided on the streets and the, the need for this legitimization of this power is very important. And I think that's why the, now Kyrgyzstan is trying to get some support of the new uh, leaders of Kyrgyzstan is trying to get regional support and they're making this short trips uh, to the regional countries, to Russia, uh, Kazakhstan traveled to Russia, then uh, Kazakhstan, and finally he arrived to Uzbekistan. And what uh, can do regional countries? I think uh, the uh, options are not very wide. They're quite limited. They don't want to be to intervene in this situation. They want to make this situation as, uh, as Kyrgyz owned and Kyrgyz led and let the Kyrgyz side to decide on their own how they would like to construct their new government and their future. But what is important to make it within some legal uh, space, not by only by protests, by further weakening the institutions, which are already quite weak, and making and more uh, destabilize the situation, but try to make it within this legal space and and make it and to legitimize the the new leadership as soon as possible. So I think that the regional countries are not very interested to postpone these elections in this country. And I think they should at least uh, state the uh, consideration and that, that they, they would prefer, the, at least they would advise to make these uh, elections as soon as possible in order to legitimize the new leadership, whoever it will be, whoever he or she will be. Thank you, Akram. Jennifer, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say something just to follow very briefly on the point that Akram made. Um, I think that, that, the, ref, that the, the changes taking place in Uzbekistan are really instrumental and in sort of reshaping a lot of things in the region. And I think it's no small coincidence, right, that the, I think it's the foreign minister's first trip is to Uzbekistan. Um, so, uh, you know, while we focus on Russia and China, and these big players, I think there's also a sense of exhaustion from some of them about Kyrgyzstan. Um, and it's a small economy and, you know, maybe it's not as consequential, but for Uzbekistan, it's definitely consequential. And I think Uzbekistan's foreign policy, along with Kazakhstan's foreign policy, right, they've all had this multi-vectored approach, um, not non-interference with neighbors. And I think it, in Uzbekistan's case, you know, that's been pretty consistent over the past 30 years and not interfering with ethnic minorities and those kinds of issues. Exactly. And that's, you know, I, I think that there's no sign that that's going to change, uh, but that is really responsible for a lot of the stability that we're seeing. And that's just also something to keep an eye on as Uzbekistan reforms. I think it's also becoming a model in many ways for countries in the region. And that, that, that was sort of unthinkable to say several years ago, but uh, people now see that the country is emerging as an economic, a real economic player and open to its neighbors. Thank you very much. Um, you know, and I would point out too, but I'm going to give the floor back to our host here in a second, um, that, you know, the reaction from Uzbekistan was very different this time than it was 10 years ago, for instance. I remember when they had the 2010 revolution, uh, Karimov said something to the effect of, uh, no one in my country is envious of the freedom-loving people of Kyrgyzstan having watched this, whereas this time, uh, Uzbek Prime Minister Abdullah Aripov is so far the only one who's actually congratulated uh, the new Kyrgyz leadership. So it's a totally different situation. Um, and on that note, I would like to give the floor back over to our host. And I'm sorry I didn't get to your question, Abahan. I know that you had one about are all these things finance, do, do revolutions, these movements have to be financed privately somehow or another. Uh, but maybe you could speak on that a little bit too in your closing remarks, please. Uh, you know, Bruce, I think you have so many questions. Maybe we can give two more, uh, three minutes to our speakers, and then I just okay. uh, well, close it. Thank you very much. You know, then I'm going to go, since, like I said, I liked your question, and you're the host. Uh, I, I think it's something of an obligation. Um, so, oh. <laughs> uh, 
So let's do that is uh, considering the, the, you know, the predatory, predatory states concept that Jennifer is talking to, um, you know, is, is there any possibility for protest movements that have other drivers than ones that are sponsored specifically by, um, uh, with the financial support of, of opposition elites? Jennifer, you look like you're ready. Yeah, to so, so I, I would say that, so, you know, the, the predatory theory is really the one that takes us not from, takes us from protest to conflict. Right. So you can have protests without the predation and you can have protests, I think, without finance. And I think this is one of the points that we I think all of us have raised today um, is that these you, now you have these with social media and social networks, you have much more spontaneity. So the nature of civil society, sort of the things that like Scott Radnitz was describing in his work years ago, right, was about you know, mobilization of groups without social media. Now, with social media, you have um, you know, spontaneous spontaneously emergent groups that can coalesce, come together, they can protest. They may not be good at the second part of what civil society often does, right? And that's service provision or forming coalitions or engaging in advocacy, that there, there you need resources. Um, but I think for these, you can, you can have a revolution, right? And you see this in Belarus as well. Like for a long time, I think very similar to what Colleen mentioned, these groups were not calling themselves political I think there was also a lot of mimicking of what was going on in Belarus, right, among uh, among the Kyrgyz uh, civil society leaders, right, using sort of the same language. Um, but it wasn't financed. I mean, who, who knows, right? There are things that we probably don't know about it, but these seem, really seem to be spontaneously emergent groups. Um, but in the long term, you know, to do or to, to emerge as organizations, you need something else. Colleen? Yeah, so I think that that is a great point that social media does provide, it lowers the costs of mobilizing, it does create opportunities for this more spontaneous mobilization. But I, I want to add that uh, social media is not um, totally absent of financial support and of money. And I think what was particularly striking about Japadov's rise to becoming acting president is just that it came totally out of nowhere, that he was in prison one night on the streets the next and the day after was being pushed as prime minister by various factions within parliament. Um, and what's been really interesting is watching how this support has played out, uh, played out across different platforms on social media. So I think it's common for people to just to lump this all together as you know social media as a singular space or as a, a single thing that it is a tool that can be used, but it's the, the current unrest in Kyrgyzstan shows the importance of really careful observation across platforms. And that the way that these platforms are built and their institutional, uh, that like, yeah, the way that these platforms work and which ones allow for communication or for video um, has created, I think, different incentives and different opportunities for these various political groups. So it's been interesting is watching Instagram and Twitter versus Facebook and YouTube. So I think in the last two years, it's been really common for political activity to happen primarily on Instagram. Um, but what was striking about the unrest in um, October is how behind the scenes, there's all of this work happening on Facebook and on YouTube, which until recently had not been super political or had not been spaces for political, um, for, for political conversations. Um, and I think that this is where um, there was also a question about the diaspora, which I'll, I'll touch on here, is that the top 10 YouTube channels, uh, Kyrgyz language YouTube channels that were putting out um, media about Japarov are all financed by uh, Kyrgyz who live in Russia. Um, so this is the diaspora creating an alternative media space that is highly viewed. The, these, some of these videos about Japarov that are pro Japarov have hundreds of thousands of views in, in a very short period of time. Um, and so I think that what like watching that space um, that the, how um, these groups are financed and um, where their incentives are coming from can might be might be a clue to understanding how Japadov came to power. But um, the other is that on, on Facebook, the the main group that's in support of um, Sadr Chapatov went overnight from 15,000 followers to 150,000 followers. And there was a big question about like how many of these are, if not bots, but people who were pushed towards joining this group and pushed towards posting messages in support of him. And I think that it's important to remember that 
these sorts of bots or supportive accounts don't necessarily come for free. But one of the puzzles that is remaining a month out from the elections is who exactly is it that is sponsoring this or who is sponsoring Japadov's rise to power? I think that that's still an unanswered question. Um, and one that hopefully we get some answers um, in, in upcoming weeks, because it could um, help us understand more about the trajectory of, of, of proposed political reform. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, and I'd also like, before I give the floor back to Abahan, uh, I'd also like to thank the Institute for War and Peace Reporting and the Central Asian Bureau of Analytical Reporting for hosting this event and for inviting me to uh, be the moderator. So Abahan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bruce, dear all. What an incredible event it was, really. I had a great pleasure listening to all of you. I would like to extend my gratitude to uh, everyone who joined the event today. And I would like especially like uh, to thank our panel of speakers and the chair of today's event, Jennifer Murtazashvili, Colin Wood, Fleming Speedball Hansen, Fabio Endeo, Akram Umarov, and indeed Bruce Penner, for facilitating the discussion and raising many important questions. You really gave us a great tour of the issues and challenges like political unrest, border conflicts, and especially the Kyrgyz protests that we're experiencing today in the region. I'm sure uh, you underline, uh, underlined uh, for us the great opportunity of being aware and thinking freshly about these problems and possible ways out of them. Uh, our discussion uh, today would not be possible without the great help from our experts and IWPR wonderful team. So I hope that our discussion today will not vanish in vain and the dialogue and search for solution will continue within the framework of IWPR activities in our partners. I sincerely hope you enjoy today's discussion. Please follow our news and join the upcoming events in 3 wkbaraasia Thank you very much for your participation. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much.